Good evening, everybody, and welcome to History Author Talks. I'm Roger Williams, and it took a little bit longer to let everybody in this evening because we have a lot of people this evening. This is going to be a very, this is obviously a very popular topic, which I am absolutely thrilled about, um, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, before we start, I want to remind everybody that you are on mute, um, and if you want to ask questions as we go through the program, you will use the chat feature. Uh, in using the chat feature, those questions will come to me, and I will splice them into our question and answer um, session with our author tonight. Um, I wanted to just give you a quick update on the 10crucialdays.org. We had uh, the um, reenactment of a Washington crossing the Delaware just this past Sunday. Got through a little bit of a rain, but it was a, a very successful uh, event. And after the event, the hereditary organizations, the Sons of the American Revolution, the Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Sons of uh, Society of Cincinnati um, had commemorative uh, wreath-laying events tell you a little bit more about some other events coming up. Also wanted to let you know that uh, The Crossing, the musical, The Crossing in the Ten Crucial Days, we continue uh, to work on um, our development with The Crossing. We're still looking for high schools that are interested in uh, partnering with us in a license-free manner uh, as we develop this wonderful teaching tool. So you can reach me, uh, Roger, at 10crucialdays.org if, if you're interested in talking about that. Our author's book uh, is available um, on uh, in, in going to uh, 10 Crucial, I'm sorry, uh, historyauthortalks.com. Uh, and you will be able to see right on uh, the uh, page, the title page there, that um, you will be able to purchase um, our author's book right at uh, historyauthortalks.com. It's also available uh, wherever books are sold, online or at your favorite bookstore, or you can go to the gift shop at Washington Crossing Historic Park. They have copies as well. Um, I am... Um, I also wanted to let you know that I had a uh, with my, some of my uh, SAR uh, compatriots and I visited the National Council for the Social Studies, where we had an opportunity to talk to a lot of history teachers um, this a uh, couple of weeks ago, and that was that was terrific. Um, I had the opportunity today to visit the Armory in Philadelphia and had a personal tour of the museum of the First Troop. Uh, Philadelphia City Cavalry. That was a terrific experience. Um, so uh, I'm, I encourage everybody to uh, visit Philadelphia to to look that up. Uh, it's a, they were very active in the 10 Crucial Days campaign. So that's a little bit of an update. Um, some commercials about things that are going on around here and in the 10 Crucial Days area. Um, I um, wanted to now I'd love to introduce you to our our author uh, this evening Frederica Baer is an associate professor of history um, and division head for arts and humanities at Pen Pennsylvania State University Abington College she holds a PhD in history from Brown her research um, focuses on the experience of the German-speaking peoples in North America from the revolutionary period to the late 19th century Along with the book we're discussing this evening, she is the author of The Trial of Frederica, uh, Frederick Erbily, Language, Patriotism, and Citizenship in Philadelphia German Community, 1790 to 1830. You can learn more about uh, Frederick at her website, which is frederickabear.com, F-R-I-E-D-E-R-I-K-E-B-A-E-R.com. Tonight's focus is on her new book, Hessians, German Soldiers in American Revolutionary War. As most of you know, I'm a historical interpreter at the 10 Crucial Days Historic Area, and uh, this is homework for me. Um, I, in understanding what happened in my backyard, December 1776 and January 1777. And um, I, um, uh, I, but it's also a story of what happened to Germans at the birth of our nation. I confess at the onset, 
I know I've got way more questions tonight than we can possibly answer in just one more one hour. So today's program is really meant to be a preview of a thoroughly researched and deftly written uh, engaging narrative. Uh, so without further ado, let me welcome you to Dr. Frederica Baer. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. I, I have to say it, it's so nice to have this set up as a Zoom meeting and not as a webinar because I can actually see people <laughs> and see names. And there are some, some familiar names, some people I know personally and others whose work I know. So it's it's really nice um, to, to have you all here this evening. And thank you, Roger, for inviting me to be part of your program. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, and I mean what I said. I mean, I I was telling to everybody, I was telling uh, Frederic before she joined me this evening, um, I have a little bit of a confession to make. And despite the fact that I started reading her book a few weeks ago, I'm still not done. Um, hers is one of these kinds of books that you you just savor. Uh, it, it. I love reading the the footnotes, the the amount of primary search, primary uh, source material that that you used in this book is uh, is just stunning. <laughs> it's really fascinating uh, things that I'm not not used to seeing at at all. At the onset of your book, you state it soon became clear that a large number of the Hessians. Um, um, would come from outside, or a large number of the soldiers would come from outside Britain's borders. Explain why. Yeah, that's a it's a good question. So obviously, as you you all know, war breaks out in the spring of seventeen seventy five, and already very very quickly, um, the the Brit the Britain or the British government officials officers um, agree that. Um, more soldiers needed to be in North America to put down this rebellion. And some early estimates are maybe 20,000 or so men would be needed, specifically in Boston or New England. Um, the king um, it was tried to get soldiers initially from Russia. Um, they are, he, that was the, the Britain had entered into these kind of agreements with, with Russia in the past, so this was not really shocking that the king would do that, would try to reach out to, to the Tsarina. They tried to get 20,000 soldiers um, for various reasons that did not work out. Ultimately, Russia declined to make this many men available. Um, the king also tried to recall a what was called the Scots Brigade, which was in the, in the Netherlands at the time, had been there for decades. Um, the Netherlands um, wavered and ultimately decided maybe the king could use them, but not outside of Europe. And it was clear that Britain needed troops that could be sent outside of Europe. Britain also, or the government, the king, uh, knew right away that it would not be possible to raise a sufficient number of men in other parts of the empire, even though, of course, they did raise some men, you know, they're, they're, they're loyalists in America or Native American allies, they are Irish and so forth, but the numbers just didn't add up. And the king was extremely reluctant and ultimately decided not to raise new regiments in England itself. So he did what he had done for more than a century uh, already and turned to German rulers um, to hire out military units. So this was accepted military practice, and some of these German rulers had already offered troops over the summer, over the course of the summer. So he knew already that there were German rulers that would have troops available. And I think it's worth, it's also worth pointing out that this was the absolute dawn of the industrial age. I mean, the baby steps of the industrial age and uh, unemployment was, um, was very low. Uh, it was very easy for Britons to get Get jobs in their own country, so he, that's why the king needed king king, king needed more troops. Um, so in in America, these soldiers were from these city states, so the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the former Holy Roman Empire, were commonly referred. They're commonly referred to as Hessian mercenaries. Uh, you explain that the Germans were not all Hessians, and they were not all they were not mercenaries, but auxiliaries. Let's let's take. Let's take this one step at a time and let's take a look at where these where these are these boys are from so these well i should say these families are from let me let me what we had somebody in the chat ask the question he's interested in knowing whether or not this is a social history or a military history and i i, I will answer that question and say it's both um it is this is not 
strategy, tactics, weapons. This is and and battle movements. This is about the people. This is about the soldiers. This is about the officers and their families. Um, so with that, let's take a look and see where these where <clears throat> these families came from. Yeah, and if I may just add to 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 your response to this question, it. it when I set out to study this and write this book, I was my main questions really were what was it, who were these people? But then also, what was it like for them in North America? How are they describing the war, but also the land of the people? So it is definitely, I would say, more of a social and cultural history of, 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 of the war from the perspective of these participants. Um, so of, it's a military history in the sense that, yeah, we're talking about soldiers in the war, but the focus is not, it's not a traditional military history. So I, I do really want to emphasize that point. Yeah, yeah we're looking at this map. So um, it's a modern map <clears throat> that, that we use to, to, to just illustrate the locations of these um, territories. So at the time, of course, Germany does not exist. It's the Holy Roman Empire, which is, uh, which is comprised of more than 300 uh, territories from very small, city-states to large territories. And um, ultimately six of them agreed to hire out troops to Britain. More uh, rulers actually were, were uh, contacted by the emissary, uh, William Fawcett. Um, more territories offered troops, but for various reasons, and this, I'm discussing this in my book, these negotiations uh, were unsuccessful. So ultimately it's just the six. And the six, of course, are Hessen Kassel and Hessen Hanau. Hessen Hanau is ruled by the hereditary prince at the time. These territories ultimately will be united, but at that point, they are separate. They are together sent more than 20,000 troops, um, a total of 30,000, I should probably mention that, a total of 30,000 at least were hired out. So roughly two thirds come from Hessen Kassel and Hessen Hanau, and that's why these troops collectively known as Hessians. Others coming from Brunswick, Braunschweig, well, from Büttel, Brunswick on the map here, that's maybe 5,000 or so troops. And then we have far fewer from Anhalt Zerbst, Ansbach, Bayreuth, two separate territories, but have one ruler, and the small territory of Waldeck, which hired out a total of maybe 1,200 or so men, one regiment, but with reinforcements, numbers added up to about 1,200 over the course of the war. Hanover, I just want to mention, Hanover does not rent out troops to Britain. They are not auxiliary forces. As I'm sure many of you know, Hanover is ruled over by the elector. The king is the elector. So he, yeah, <laughs> he made it go away. So the king actually uses Hanoverians, but they are sent to the Mediterranean to right. relieve British troops stationed there that can then be sent elsewhere. So they are not, I mentioned them briefly in my book, but they're not considered, they're not con called Hessians, they're not part of the kind of auxiliary forces. There's also a small number of men, including Hanoverians, up to maybe around 2,000 or so, just to round up a little bit, that were recruited by essentially a military contractor, his name is Colonel von Scheiter, he enters into an agreement, a personal agreement with Britain that says, I'm going to, for money, basically for commission, raise soldiers that can be sent to America. He is not able to raise as many as he wants to, but maybe, I don't know, 1800 or so are raised. These are distributed across British infantry regiments that are in America to make up for losses. These so soldiers are probably properly called mercenaries. The other ones, I don't think really um, can be considered mercenaries. So I, let's clear that up, everybody. Not mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see it everywhere. And, and I do understand. I mean, I think it's a, it is a little bit tricky, perhaps. I understand that it's not a totally clear cut. But when you look at a mercenary, you know, when you, when you, when you define a mercenary as an individual, a man, who is who signs up for a foreign war or foreign army um, to fight in that war for personal gain or profit? That's sort of a definition of a mercenary, and there are individuals in this war that meet that definition. And I think it's worth pointing out that in many of the writings of the of the period, many of the contemporary yeah. writings from the Americans were calling them mercenaries. So, oh yeah, um, yeah. So and because it's an it's a it's a derogatory term. I think it's used to 
portray the soldiers as soldiers who have no business of being in America. And it's true, it is a foreign war and someone is making money. I mean, the rulers are getting paid subsidy payments. And uh, not just it's not just Americans who call them mercenaries, but the British British critics of all of this are also using that term very liberally throughout, especially in the beginning of the war. So how, how did these German rulers benefit from these treaties and what, what were the German yeah. soldiers paid and by whom? Yeah, so in the, in the ba very basic um, arrangement is, you know, Britain gets all these um, units. And basically, the, the, German, um, the German rulers are raising the troops and they're creating companies or regiments with officers, the whole, the whole thing, and they're rented out. The rulers of these territories, for example, the Landgraf of, of Hessen Kassel or the, the Duke of Braunschweig, gets uh, subsidy payments from the British government, annual fairly substantial subsidy payments. That's all um, you know, laid out and agreed upon in so-called subsidy treaties. Um, the payments are made while the troops are in service, which of course no one knows how long that will be. <laughs> you don't know in the beginning you know, how long the war will last. Usually they include clauses like, and maybe a year after, uh, after the end of the hostilities or whatever. The rulers use this money to pay down debts. Many of these territories basically just don't have enough marketable resources to raise revenue, to support their lifestyles, to keep armies, to do what they want to do and to have political influence and power. So one way to raise revenue is to rent out troops if you have enough men to do that. So, so that's one thing, but the soldiers of course uh, get paid as well. So that's important to keep in mind. Explain the blood money clause that the British oh. have with the Brunschweig and Hessen Hanau and Waldeck. Yeah, it's a clause that shows up in three of these agreements um, that stipulated that um, the, uh, the rulers would get a certain amount of money for every three men injured and every one man killed. And that clause and blood money clause, I mean, it's a pretty harsh label, but that clause was used by critics in Europe and in America to highlight sort of the greed of the rulers because it made the rulers look like they're literally, you know, sacrificing their own subjects and they're making money of it. And it does look bad, there's no doubt about it. The money really was meant to cover expenses associated with uh, recruiting a, and a replacement and, and sending that replacement over to America. Um, but it, it definitely enhanced the very bad reputation of the rulers doing it all of this for greed, selling their own subjects to be slaughtered on the fields of America. And there's language like that that you get in the attacks of all of this. So we we just got a question from uh, one of one of the members of our audience who happens yep. to be General Jason Bowen, Inspector General of the United States Marine Corps, who has written a book called Washington's Marines, which is coming out in March. We had a program with uh, General Bowen a few weeks ago. It's a terrific book. He asked the question: Were each uh, were, did they all get to paid the same, or were these separate? contracts, uh, the treaties negotiated with at different rates? Uh, did, did Brunschweig get more or less than Valdeck or how did that work out? Yeah, good question. So yes, those were, these were independent sovereign states. I mean, they were all part of the Holy Roman Empire, but they are, these negotiations are completely separate. So the, the, the British emissary, again, his name is William Fawcett. He travels first to Braunschweig, then he goes down the list and he negotiates with representatives of the respective uh, rulers, the terms of these agreements. They are, they share, they have a lot in common, but they do also, uh, there's also some differences. And uh, generally the pay was very similar, the subsidy payments. Um, but some, I, I think, especially the larger territories were able to negotiate more favorable terms because they knew that Britain needed their men. And so they took advantage of that to some extent. I, I, off the top of my, ha my head, I don't know the details. It is, it, it is in my book. I go th through the yeah. treaties to some extent to, to illustrate that. So there's a lot in common, but also some some difference. Um, right. the more, some are more, more favorable than others. The more you, the more you send, the more you get per head. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, they knew, they, I mean, think some of these German rulers really knew that Britain was in a bind and was quite desperate at that point. So they did try to get the most out of it, um, you know, to make the, all of these men available. So the Whigs in Britain <clears throat> who yeah. had many questions and trepidations about the American war was all about. Yeah. What, what um, explain the reaction of the British press and the critics of King George III and the and Parliament for hiring these these German troops. Oof, where do I start? <laughs> uh, uh, so as you I'm sure all know, there was a significant opposition to the war period. And so that was already there. But then when the king uh, decided, and then you know, Lord North was all in favor, Lord North says in early 76, when we get these Germans and we send them to North America, we will end this war without, he says, without the further effusion of blood. So the government, people in charge are very much, at least they say, they're convinced this is it's going to be expensive, but this is going to take care of this little rebellion that's going on over in North America. The critics really use this um, as ammunition, essentially, to attack the ministry and, and more so the, the government, not so much the king. Um, it's expensive. That's one thing, of course. You know, it's very expensive to hire all these troops. But then other criticism is also, we say, although we've used German troops many times before, including Hessians, we've never sent them abroad. German troops had never been used auxiliary forces outside of North America. So this is new. And in addition of that, we're using the troops in a war against our own subjects. And you have to look at the Americans, of course, as British subjects. So thus was the, it was seen as, be, as really um, uh, in a, a tyrannical abuse of power to use to hire mercenaries to fight against British subjects on another continent. So if you are very critical of the war, this is of course something that you would not support. The other issue is that it is embarrassing um, for Britain, mighty Britain, to go to these essentially petty princes in continental Europe and beg them for troops, as though Britain itself, Britain alone is not capable of you know, gaining control and keeping the colonies within the empire. Britain also saw itself as more enlightened. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is of course a, the king and the parliament, freedom of the press, all of those things, things that German territories generally did not have. So not only asking we, we are asking Germans to help us, but we're asking essentially tyrants, despots to help us. So what will happen when we're introducing all these German subjects into North America? Will they maybe stay there permanently and impose some kind of military order over our poor, you know, colonial subjects? So these are, and on top of that, are they loyal? Maybe they're just looking for a free ride to North America and they will desert as soon as they see how, you know, how wonderful that all of their countrymen are living over there, the people that had emigrated over the previous few decades, an estimated 80,000 or so. These are all, these are just some of some of the points that are raised in the press and also in Parliament. I mean, there are very heated debates in Parliament about all of this. That plays right into my next question, which is, yeah. um, you know, we we have this image of th these crack, well-trained, experienced, uh. uh, well-supplied regiments that were being sent over to America, you I, disclose an alternate reality here. Generally speaking, what was the makeup of these Hessian regiments? Yeah, I, I, I think from what I've seen, that the majority of these troops were spe specially recruited for this war in America. Um, they uh, did not have military experience. Um, they had certainly not fought in the war uh, before they went to America. Um, they had some really, uh, there was, they had a couple of weeks of training under the belt before they were sent in on some kind of campaign. So a large number of these men, you know, I say in my book, I think Britain, Britain ex may have expected to get a well-trained, you know, sort of ready to go military um, in, uh, for this war. But in reality, that, that was only partly the case. So all of the, um, so in other words, they're, they're agreeing, they're signing these treaties. 
and they have to, especially in the first treaties are signed in late 75, and then it goes into 76. And over the course of the war, we have a few additional treaties for additions and replacements and so forth. But the pressure is on early, right away. Um, Britain hoped to send maybe 19, 20,000 troops to North America in the spring of 76 alone. I mean, they really hoped to get more, many of these men over for the first campaign. These men have to materialize somehow. So what the uh, the regiment, the, the 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 rulers did is there's no draft and no in the modern sense. They they use things like enrollment lists, you know, sending officials into their communities and drawing up lists of men of the right age and physical fitness and height and all of that. And then they identified essentially and we ordered men to muster for service that seemed eligible for service. So it wasn't a, really a draft or a militia, but it was just not really. Very, no, yeah. No, so, there were. I do want to add. I do want to add. Uh, uh, no, many of the men were uh, uh, on furlough, so there were men that were officially in the military, but they were in reality working on the farm eleven months out of the year. They weren't really sort of like a reserve type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the goal is to combine these new recruits with um, seasoned soldiers officers certainly and veterans I mean you don't want to send just like these young men without any experience um, I want to give one quick example Valdek which agreed to furnish one regiment roughly 670 men what Valdek did is tiny territory um, it recalled 200 soldiers that were in Dutch service at the time they had a regiment that had been rented out to the Netherlands the United Providences of the Netherlands so they're reaching out basically 200 of these men get certificates that release them from Dutch service to transfer in what becomes the third Waldeck regiment that goes to America. So that's 200 men, but the other 400 something needed to somehow be recruited and added. So General Bohm, to make it complete. General Bohm also wants to know, yeah. could they refuse to go to America? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of course, they could. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, so ba ba if you were identified as someone who is, you know, eligible, um, you have the right height, you have the right age, and report to mustering, you better go to, in Kassel, it was a place called Siegenhain, you re-report to mustering. Um, however, one of the things that, that really struck me when I went in the, to the archives in Germany, and I, I did extensive archival research, I found quite a lot of documents that serve as evidence for young men who did not follow orders, um, who hid, you know, in the basically the next le left the territory when when the recruiter came around, um, locked into the house. Parents wouldn't open the door, um, or you know, or just just try to avoid service. Now, what happened in those kind of cases is. The authorities, of course, are very upset. Uh, they need to. There's a lot of pressure again to raise these men, and there can there could be serious punishment. Uh, for example, um, fathers were jailed, something like that. You mm. know, so you throw the father in jail. The whole family depends on him, and you said, as soon as your son reports, we let you go. Um, so there is certainly tremendous pressure. If the son turned up for service, it changed his mind or whatever. Usually. He was not subjected to punishment. Um, usually, there's lots of pardons. You know, if you turn up within one week, we'll forgive you everything you've done. We'll find. Ultimately, we just want these men to go to America. So, so men, men have tried to avoid it, but I think it's very diff. It's like it's, it's very difficult to get out of it. So the pressure is very strong that that you that you report as ordered. So. Um... So m m many of the Hessians, um, both in the officer corps and the rank and file, um, ac were accompanied by large contingents of spouses and sisters and other camp yeah. followers. This was customary in European conflicts or yeah. particular to the American war? Um, I'm not an expert on European warfare, but as far as I know, that has always been the case as long as we have modern warfare, that there are camp followers. and. I think it was the same in Europe. So many kind of uh, civilian yeah, employees, um, women, children, um, sometimes spouses, sometimes women that were employed in in the, in the in the hospitals or as servants or cooks or whatever. 
it's a lot hundreds probably hundreds of women and children went to North America and then more were added in North America to that. So what was the frame of mind of the Hessian rank and file in the voyage to America? How, how much did they know? Did they know where they were going? What did they think of mm -hmm. uh, their role of fighting Americans? Generally speaking, they knew very little. Um, so you would think, you know, by, on the by by seven by the mid 1770s, again, we estimate that maybe 80,000 Germans. Uh, or German-speaking people from continental Europe had emigrated to North America. And they had certainly, you know, written letters back home, and there had been uh, some publications over the years sort of extolling also the, the, the promise of North America as an attractive land of, of settlement for German farmers and so forth. So there was some information about North America, but it was very limited, and it wasn't necessarily readily available in the territories that we're talking about. Early German settlers came from places like the Palatine, for example. They're not necessarily from places like Anhalt Zerbst. So um, Germans obviously knew that North America existed. They may have heard of Pennsylvania, but they knew very little about it. They knew very little about the land. They almost certainly knew hardly anything about the war and the causes, the reasons why this war was going on. Um, and that included uh, the officers as well. Um, there are some that seems like as when they when they um, you know when they were getting ready to go to North America and especially during the stopover in Britain, the vessel they all went off first to Britain and from there they had to board a transport to North America. Some bought books, bought it, newspapers, got information. It seems like some were really eager to inform themselves to some extent, but. Generally speaking, I think their, their knowledge was very limited. So um, they weren't they, that concerned either, honestly. When, when they got over here, what was the relationship between the British and the Hessian commanders? And mm -hmm. how much did the British and the Hessian troops interact or did they? Were they were they kept separate? Well, the the military units almost with a a handful of exceptions were essentially kept uh, separate in a sense that, you know, you have here's a Leib Regiment or Regiment von Donau. I mean, these are regiments with their own officers, their own structures, they're, they're, uh, they're not separated. Um, gen I say generally speaking, um, there, are, there are a couple of exceptions where the Jäger in particular, the Jäger Corps, um, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, sort of the German equivalent of maybe a rifleman, the, the hunters, um, it becomes very clear early on that they are really well suited for this war in America, and they often um, are divided into smaller units, and they often go uh, go out with um, with American units um, uh, to do whatever. Um, so there's there's some exceptions, but for the most part, they are stay together. But of course, they they camp alongside and fight alongside British units. So there is interaction and then in 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 uh, uh camp and in in uh, in in garrison and, and these kind of situations they often are exercised together and then it's in in these kind of situations that some german officers will in their in their records um mention some frustration uh the big issue i think is the language barrier um we have to remember that very few germans spoke english um, Fran French was kind of the lingua franca, but many didn't really have a good command of that either. So you have German officers who will complain that they are being exercised, their men, their and alongside British or loyalist um, soldiers by an English-speaking commander using only English commands uh, that their men could not understand. Hmm. Every a general rule the highest commanders were always British. So as a, with a again, couple of exception, Knüpphausen at some point very briefly is in command of the troops in New York when Clinton is gone. But for the most part, they have to report to a British officer and that's not always, um, you know, that's that, that it can be challenging, I think, for, for German officers who may so be the first for more independence. 
the first major campaign, the New York campaign. Yeah. Um, what was the the I mean, this was when the the Hessians, the Germans first faced their American yeah. enemy. And um, <laughs> despite the fact that you had said earlier, these weren't necessarily uh, well, um, you know, experienced Hessian troops. They rolled over the British and the Hessians just rolled over the Americans. So what was their opinion after the the um, the the uh, New York campaign? Yeah, I, th they, I think they they enter the war uh, uh, with a sig significant confidence. Um, again, they don't know much about America, but what they do know is when they get here, they see and when they first encounter um, uh, American soldiers or, or rebels, as they call them throughout the entire war, uh, they call them rebels. Um, they see men that are poorly clad, that have don't have st standard issue weapons, um, that have beards, uh, um, which makes them look like um, a German word Spitzbuben, like scoundrels. In other words, doesn't make them look like proper soldier. So the impression of the American troops is not very positive. Um, they they literally don't look like soldiers, at least like a European imagines what the soldier should look like. And even if you're in a newly recruited, maybe 17 year old, you know, Hessian soldier like Johannes Reuber, uh, who was captured at Trenton. You are wearing a uniform, especially in the beginning of the war, that looks sharp, you know, that identifies you as a member of a particular unit. Um, you are clean shaven and, and all of that. So contrast that with sort of the appearance of the Americans. The other uh, um, uh, early impressions and yeah the, I think the fall of 76 is really really important the impressions is that the Americans are running away most of the time um the the, the campaign does go go quite well for Britain and so you have um the, the the whole campaign through New York and then of course the capture of Fort Washington not saying that there's not serious fighting I and mean, the Americans are certainly putting up a fight but at the end of the day there seem to be running away um, more often than choosing to face the British in battle. And from the Hessian perspective, this is not some smart strategic decision by General Washington, but it's essentially evidence for cowardice. I mean, you, it's a, it's, it's, it, they're very arrogant. Um, they're overconfident that they are so, the better military. So was it a culture shock for the Hessians just to sort of wrap their heads around the enslaved population. I mean, what what yeah. was that what was that impression when they got to America? Yeah. So um, when they first come to America, so the first the first Germans actually set foot on Canadian soil, but then in the summer, if two m massive um, contingents of Hessians that arrive in New York in the summer of seventy six, and they describe what they see in great detail. I mean, it does. I think service evidence for their curiosity and also that a lot of it is very unfamiliar to them and they just describe it in diaries and letters some of this is sent home during the war to be published in in German speaking Europe so, so suddenly in other words there's all this information available and people really want to know what's going on now that German soldiers are fighting there and descriptions of slavery or enslaved people is is a big part of that um Initially, the Germans are impressed by the prosperity that they see, the richness of the land. And they wonder why Americans would rebel, okay, considering that they're doing so well. They're also right away right that one reason why white Americans are so wealthy is because they're exploiting Black people. They are not necessarily um concerned about the, the the whole idea that there are um masters and, and servants uh, i mean hessian is an extremely hierarchical society they even they still had serfs there at the time so the soldiers themselves the average soldier who you know the average private who is probably poor a poor man uh was used to a system uh, or a society where there are some people that are better off, a lot of people are very poor, a lot of people have essentially no power, 
um, and very little opportunity to move up in the world. When they come to North America, they don't really understand, I think, what slavery is as a legal institution. But what they see is the violence that goes with it. And their comment on that, their comment on how poorly and violently white Americans treat black men, women, and children. And they describe this in New Jersey and Staten Island, Long Island, in New York. And they will describe it, not surprisingly, even in even more detail when they're going south, where they see you know, plantation slavery and, 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 and uh, they, they, they tell stories of uh, brutality and violence. So they're shocked. They're really shocked by that. And we have a Hessian, Hessian for example, who says um, a, a farmer in Hessian, uh, in Hessian treats his uh, cattle better than, than a sl slave owner treats his enslaved people. Um, and Hessian chaplain says, uh, his name is Becker. We have a number of letters by him. He's super critical of the Americans. He's a Lutheran chaplain. He writes, if there was a people in America that should be fighting for their freedom, it would be black people. He, he, <laughs> he writes that in a letter back home. So that the, the, the tension between here people rebelling, fighting for liberty, and the fact that there's slavery is they see that and they comment on that quite extensively. So speaking specifically about the New York campaign, there's there's much yeah. early historiography of the American Revolution presenting the Hessians as ruthless and giving no quarter and their American enemy. Yeah. What was the Hessian attitude toward their enemy and the civilian population? Yeah, um, I think this was a very violent war. I think that's a kind of a side of the Revolutionary War that isn't, I think it's, we're beginning to appreciate that a little bit more, um, but it is a very violent war on all sides. Um, there's no doubt that um, these troops plundered um, and abused uh, what we would call civilian uh, population. And there is documented instances too when they did not give quarter. Um, but, and, and not justifying or defending that, but I think it happened on all sides. The image of the Hessians is, it's interesting even before the first Germans land in America, the patriots in America are already actively cultivating and sort of this image of the Hessian as a, a ruthless mercenary who's going to come to America to burn down your towns and, and rape your women and murder your children. I mean, we literally get language like this. We get it already in early 76, as soon as rumors start arriving in North America, these, that these treaties have been signed. At first, it's rumors, proof arrives in May of 76. And as we all know, um, there's a, a bunch of patriots trying to convince um, Americans to support independence. And I think the image of the king sending these viol violent invaders essentially over is used as, as a, basically a propaganda tool to convince more people, not just to fight for independence or to support independence, but ultimately also then to take up arms and defend their homes from this aggressor. That image continues to be you know, enhanced and repeated or whatever uh, in, in the press and proclamations and so forth through the end of uh, 1776. There's also a lot of reports. The Congress at some point collects reports of atrocities, of British atrocities to, in doing their campaign in New Jersey. It's sometimes very hard to determine for us what's really happened and what may be propaganda and uh, exaggerated. There's no doubt that it was very violent. It's not always easy to distinguish fact from fiction when you look at these kind of reports. So in chapter five, uh, you unveil the Hessian perspective of what one of their officers called the unhappy affair, affair at Trenton. And I've read many articles about the raid on Trenton and its aftermath. So I thank you for your fresh look at the events of the Hessian perspective. Um, the audience is going to have to read the book to understand both the combatants and the German press and civilians uh, viewed this 
transformative event. But I, I did want to ask you to explain mm -hmm. how this one engagement changed the relationship between the British and the Hessian commanders uh, with each other. You mean Trenton? Yeah, I uh, I don't. Uh, I would say that um, the the main impact of Trenton, aside from the fact that it's a morale boosting event for the Americans, is that it does change the view of the 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 Americans of the Hessians to some extent. Mm -hmm. I just I just you know, you know described sort of this image of this sort of violent, ruthless, murderous mercenary. Um. Also, from the beginning, there was sort of this other image of the innocent victim of tyrants who sold to fight in this war that does not concern him. And victim of tyrants, not unlike the Americans. So we have that image already through 76 as well. And in fact, we have um, uh, the Congress um, issues several uh, offers of land and property and liberty, basically, for any German who decided to desert and settle in America. And those kind of offers, of course, are trying to convince the Americans that these Germans are just friendly people. They can be your neighbors. They're not the monsters. Trenton reinforces that much more positive image. And I think that George Washington uses, essentially, the capture of the official numbers sometimes that you see are 800 something. I, I think it's more than a thousand people if you add all the civilians, if you add or include the women and children that were part of it and documented black servants that were part of the German units at the time already. George Washington takes advantage of this amazing opportunity. You have 1000 of these individuals that you can march through Philadelphia and show the people that they really have nothing to fear. And he appeals to the, the Americans. He said, please be nice to these. Now, uh, not every Philadelphian is nice. They throw stuff at them and yell at them and stuff like that. They have to be locked up for their own safety. But it shifts the image. Uh, basically, these, these Hessians uh, look like uh, people you, 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 have to be, you have to pity, you have to be sorry for. Um, so that, if in that regard, Trenton is important. Now, Trenton, of course, is a huge embarrassment for the Germans. Um, when they're, when the first reports uh, arrive in Germany, some German periodicals that are kind of trying to cover the war don't believe it happened. There's like, no way. That is probably one of these American stories. There's just no way that <laughs> Americans will be able to overtake a, a garrison like this. Um, and then gradually they get more news and gradually they realize, oh, it, it did happen. But they kind of put a little bit of a spin of it or spin on it. What they are arguing is it was basically an unfair battle. The Americans were only able to defeat, kind of trick them. Also, it's Christmas. I mean, it's really not the way you fight war, right? Um, it's in the middle of a snowstorm. And then their commander, Johann Rall, who had actually distinguished himself at Fort Washington is conveniently mortally wounded, right. can't defend himself. He gets a lot of the blame as well, that he was this chaos, he was not able to rally the troops and so forth. So I think it's an interesting story. It's embarrassing. Some Hessian rulers actually initially are worried that Britain may lose interest in hiring German troops. Interestingly, maybe not surprisingly, pretty much the opposite is true. Because Trenton, of course, if anything, prolongs the war and puts even more pressure on Britain to send more troops to North America. So, um, so that's I think that from the Hessian perspective, it, it's an interesting battle. It's not, in my mind, the most significant battle for them. I think that would be Red Bank, right? In October '77. So Trenton gets a lot of attention when when people know about the Hessian. If they know anything, they're often, that's the story, Trenton. But I think um, their participation in Red Bank and, and others is actually more significant from their perspective. And I do want to talk about Red Bank. Let's let's just touch um, for a minute on um, 
the forage wars of 1777, after the 10 crucial days, you had constantly, the Hessians and the British commanders were constantly trying to draw the Americans out into the yeah. open. And um, there was a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of detachments that were sent out to try and draw them out. How was the coordination between the officers and the uh, the British commanders and the and the Hessian officers? We learned an awful lot from Ewald. E Ewald's diaries really is rich in, in this period where yeah. we learn a lot about what what's going on. Um, so, moving to the Saratoga campaign, that that spiraled from success to morass. <laughs> And the British and Hessian armies move as they move further south. The events um, at um, near day near uh, present day uh, Bennington became another disaster uh, that exposed the Hessian regiments. Your book outlines how uh, it was Burgoyne who gambled with the Germans uh, and then blamed them for the outcome. Uh, the only engagement, but not only for the engagement, but for the loss of the entire campaign. Um, what uh, what was the Hessian after action analysis of what happened at, at Bennington and the and the Saratoga campaign? Yeah, so uh, several thousand uh, German troops accompanied Burgoyne down, um, and I think this whole campaign was struggled from the very beginning and i think the the germans that talk about it at least you know after the fact um comment on how um they have way too much stuff it's poorly prepared um the burgoyne um was not making sure that they had enough that they kept supply lines intact um they may not know it but of course there was poor communication between burgoyne and people in England and New York. So that's, of course, a big problem. But, but basically, the Germans, um, I think, blame um, Burgoyne for a poorly planned and poorly executed campaign. And the decision of Burgoyne to send a German unit to Bennington, um, Burgoyne explains at some point that he did that because the Germans were really clamoring to do something that, you know, contribute something. He also argued that the, I think the Dra Brunswick Dragoons wanted horses and they'd been complaining that they didn't have horses. So that was another reason that they should get horses. Um, but uh, in, after the fact, the German officers are um, definitely um, blaming the commander, Reed Diesel, the, 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 the commander of the Braunschweig troops who's, who's there who gets captured. Mm -hmm. Burgoyne kind of points the finger at him. And Reed Diesel himself writes uh, at least two letters to, the, to the, Brun the Duke of Brunswick explaining what happened. And he's adamant that uh, to blame the commander of the campaign. I mean, he's like, hey, <laughs> ultimately it's Burgoyne who's responsible. I mean, he's in charge. And he does question the decisions that Burgoyne makes along the way. Absolutely. So in your, in your book, you talk a lot about, so now we have all of the prisoners after the 10 crucial days campaign, and now all of the prisoners after the, yeah. after the, 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 the um, Saratoga campaign, I urge everybody to learn more. She's got a whole chapter really that talks about prisoners and how they were treated. And but if yeah. I want to add one thing. And then, of course, we have a whole whole lot more prisoners after Yorktown. Exactly. And I actually, in my book, decided to divide this into two chapters, um, sort of the early prisoners in the early years and then later, because the, the Americans start out, they don't have really a very coherent prisoner war policy. They're kind of figuring things out as they go along, and their approach really changes after a while. Um, and I think that's important to appreciate. And the treatment of German prisoners in particular is very different from the treatment of British prisoners, for example. And, right. and so I write about that, yeah. So before we end, I, I wanna ask one last question. You mentioned Red Bank earlier. Recently, yeah. the remains of 14 Hessians were discovered at the site of the Battle of Red Bank, uh, about an 11 mile march from Colonial Cooper's Ferry, which is today's Camden, New Jersey. Popular story is that Burgoyne's defeat 
at Saratoga unilaterally tipped the scales to draw the French into the war. Can you explain the significance of the action at Fort Mercer in Red Bank? Yeah, it's it's sort of it's it's also it takes place in October 1777. Um, a short story is, um, as you know, uh, Britain occupied uh, the British occupied Philadelphia again in all of these campaigns in every single campaign. Uh, Germans participated. Often the proportion, by the way, is sort of 50-50. So they're there everywhere. So they're in Philadelphia and um, the British are not able to uh, send an ad adequate supply. So their Navy cannot reach the, it basically sail into the port in part because of the forts uh, on Mud Island, but also Fort Mercer on the, that the Germans call Red Bank on the New Jersey side. So a German regiment, a uh, entirely German corps, 100% Germans, is sent over the river to attack, to take that four. And it um, ends in a, an absolute disaster. Um, they are all in, not well prepared. The, they don't, the fortifications are different than what they ex had expected. They didn't bring, I think, ladders or ax or whatever. They're basically trying to scale the wall. Americans are shooting down at them and then also rebel ships bombarding them at the same time. So um, I think maybe 2,400 soldiers went to take the fort. Um, several hundred of them were killed, including the commander of, yeah. of that action, which is Donov, which was a, who was a Borden town. When Trenton happened, he had hoped, I think, to redeem himself and you know restore his reputation. And that did not happen. One so more. it's devastating. And it's in, in October 77. So when they find out that happened and then Borgoyne surrenders, so had surrendered a few days before that. So it's a October 77 is, is just a really, really bad month. And I think, yeah, I think the France had already supported the Americans, of course. So, you know, uh, in early 78 is entering the war officially. So it, so another example of a, tremendously um, horrific and bloody battle that not a lot of people really know about but thanks to thanks to your work we we, we learn a lot about it as I suspected uh, we only got to 1777 and the may I, may I just may I just um, yeah. say one thing because that's what usually happens you don't have to get much into the war but I do want to emphasize one thing, and, and that's actually in my some of for me the most rewarding chapters to to research and write on. Right, were the ones that take the German troops into the southern colonies, including West Florida, where they fought against the Spanish. When I set out on this project, I really did not appreciate to what extent Germans were used in these campaigns as well, because the focus is so often on you know Trenton and Saratoga and sort of the north. So um, there's a lot in my book on Virginia and the Carolinas and Georgia, the occupation of Savannah and Charleston, and then also Pensacola, the siege of Pensacola and the war against Spain. And some Germans even go to Cuba. Yeah, so, uh, oh, it's, it's very it's very rich. And, and I, um, as everyone knows, I, I keep these programs an hour long. Um, I'm sure that we can. We could go. We could go on forever. I know I could. I want to thank you for your thank your you. time this evening. Um, I encourage everybody to go to uh, bookshop.org um, or History Author Talks and look at the bookshop.org uh, uh, tab so that you can purchase uh, Dr. Bear's book. Um, it is remarkable. It's so well written, and you learn so much. This is what uh, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and um, we have um, coming up uh, on January 7th and 8th, uh, we have a uh, tour, the 10 Crucial Days Historic Area on January 7th. So, uh, January 8th, we have the experience the Battle of uh, Princeton. Uh, you should go to um, Princeton uh, Battlefield Society or the PBS1777.org to learn about that. And uh, as always, uh, I encourage everyone to uh, sign up for the History Author Talks newsletter at historyauthortalks.com and support your historic sites. Uh, that's something that we all need to do. Um, Frederic, thank you so much. Uh, it was a thank you for writing the book. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time this evening. 
And I'm sorry, everybody, we couldn't get to all of your questions. Um, but you'll just have I'll come back. I'll come, come back. Yeah, well, I, you know, I let's do that. I'd love to have you back because I do want to talk. And about we can it. start in 1778. How exactly. About that? That's what, we're, you know, let's do that. I, I really would love to do that. Everybody, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>